Hi, and welcome to the video on the basics of measuring. I'm Zoe Liston. I am a realtor and an appraiser, and so I've been measuring houses for quite a few years, and we're going to talk about why measuring matters. Why does it matter to you? Why does it matter to your clients? First of all, you are representing your seller. When you go put a house, a listing into MLS, you are representing the seller and it's your job to put the uh, basic information into MLS so the other agents can see it, so buyers can see it, so they know if they want to come uh, view that house. You would never just estimate the number of bedrooms or take somebody else's word for the number of bedrooms in a house. You go to the house, you take a look at it, you make a note of the number of bedrooms yourself. Well, the same thing should be, do with, be done with size. You shouldn't just take the tax records information on size and assume that's correct. You shouldn't just take the last agent's information about the size of the home and assume that's correct either. You don't know if either one of these is up to date. They could have had an addition since the taxes were done. Different counties report size different ways. And who knows what the last agent was thinking when they put it in MLS. So remember that you're representing your seller. You are also, if you're on the buyer's side, representing your buyer. They're relying on you to know about the house. If you walk into a home and you're good enough because you've measured enough homes and you know what a 2,200 square foot house feels like, if you walk into a home and it MLS says it's 2,200 square feet and you walk in and you think, no, this isn't. This is more like a 1,600 square foot house. It's up to you to know that up front, to be able to advise your buyer, to be able to know at least if it's worth questioning and maybe you should measure it yourself. So think about who you're representing and how you can best represent them. Also, in Minnesota, it's not terribly common to think in terms of price per square foot. In other parts of the country, it is. Uh, so if you've got relocation buyers coming to town, they will often ask you about every house. What's this going price per square foot? What's this neighborhood go for on average price per square foot? You need to be able to think in those terms. It's a little more difficult in this part of the country because we have basements. In a lot of the country where there aren't basements, price per square foot makes more sense. But here, the above ground price per square foot and the basement price per square foot differ so much that it's hard to do it um, on an average. But some of your clients will ask you about that. Also, if you've ever had a client... Uh, looking at new construction. So much of new construction is done on price per square foot that they may be thinking in those terms also. So just something to keep in mind, something to be aware of. Um, also, when you put information in MLS, remember that that is not just your place to advertise the home that you're trying to sell. That is also the database that all of us use. It's the database that appraisers use to do appraisals. It's the database that other agents use to come up with market analysis, CMAs for the next properties. It's the database that agents use to do a market analysis for their buyers to determine whether or not uh, the price is appropriate that they should offer on that property. If you're just estimating the square footage or you're taking it from a, an inaccurate source, you could really mess some things up for your clients or for uh, future sales. Say you put something in MLS and you're off by about 200 square feet. As an appraiser, when I'm making adjustments on an appraisal uh, on square footage, the minimum square footage adjustment I usually make is at least $30 a square foot. So if you're off by 200 square feet on a house that I'm using as a comp and I don't get to go measure the comps, I get to measure the subject but not the comps. If you're off by 200 square feet, that's a $6,000 adjustment. Now, it's only one property and I'm working with at least three comps, so it won't always throw things off. But if I make a $6,000 adjustment and it drops the price of that uh, home, the adjusted price of that home, if the appraisal comes in $6,000 low, that is enough to ruin a deal. That's enough for a buyer to walk away. It's enough for the seller to have to renegotiate and maybe drop the price a little bit. It could really mess things up. So don't think you're just in a little bubble and if you make some mistake on the square footage that it's not going to affect anybody. It does affect anybody who uses MLS, MLS as a database. So do try to keep that in mind. Now, I don't want to scare you um, because you can't be 100% accurate on all homes. If you're 5 feet off uh, or 10 feet off here and there, it's not a huge deal. Most appraisers do not make adjustments for anything under 100 square feet difference. So if my subject house is 1,200 square feet and one of the comps is 1,250 square feet, I won't make any adjustment at all. And part of that is because 
somebody measuring may round up on one wall, somebody measuring may round down on that wall a little bit. Um, also, because if a buyer walks into a house, they can't feel the difference between 1,200 square feet and 1,250 square feet. It's not going to change how they use the house. So you do have a little bit of flexibility, so you don't have to panic about being exactly 100% accurate, but you've got to be as close as you can. Um, also, there have been cases of... Uh, sellers being or agents being sued over the size of the house that they put in MLS. Uh, people buy a house, they pay for it, they live there a few years. When they go to sell it, they find out that the house is a different size than they were told. They thought they paid a certain dollar price per square foot. You need to be able to protect yourself from that. At the very least, even if you make mistakes on measuring, in the very least, at least if you've tried and if you've got proof that you went out to the house and you did some measuring and you came up with a sketch, even if you made a mistake on it, at least you've got proof that you tried and that you were uh, working in the seller's best interest. If you don't have any proof like that, if you just say, well, I just took it off the last agent, that's not going to support you at all and not going to give you any good argument. So make sure you do uh, have some backup and some reasoning behind where you got your square footage. All right. Now, I started out as a real estate agent, and I was a realtor for a couple of years before I became an appraiser. And I got to be honest that as a realtor, nobody ever even mentioned to me that I needed to measure a house. Never came up. You certainly don't learn about it in class or anything like that. And I understand why realtors often don't do it. For one, you're dressed too well. As a realtor, you're going out to appointments, you're trying to look nice, you're in nice shoes, you don't want to be stomping around somebody's backyard and going through the snow and things like that. Perfectly understandable. When you're ready to measure the house, put on some sturdy shoes, put on some clothes that you don't mind walking into the bushes in and getting yourself a little bit dirty. Uh, in the winter, wear some boots. I wear gaiters a lot of times because they keep the snow out of the, uh, the boots better because you will be walking up close to the house where a lot of the snow drifts and gets into piles up there. So I completely understand when you're going to a listing appointment, you're often not dressed to measure the house. Also, about six months out of the year, it's dark when you're going to listing appointments, right? You're going there in the evenings and it's dark out. You measure the house to get the overall square footage from the outside of the home. If it's dark out, you can't get that done. So I completely understand. So here's my recommendation. Come back after you list the house, okay? After you've got the paperwork signed, uh, after you put the lockbox on the house, tell them you'll be back tomorrow afternoon or you'll be back tomorrow morning and come back in your grubby clothes, come back when it's light out, and come back when they're not there. You'll be much uh, better off measuring when you're dressed appropriately, when you can see, and when they're not watching you and asking you questions and offering to hold the tape measure. Even as many years as I've been doing this, when somebody else is with me and I'm talking to them and they're holding the tape measure, I make mistakes every time. So you're much better off just coming back another time and doing it when they're not there, when you've got some peace and quiet and you're dressed appropriately. Also, I understand that you don't do it very often probably because you don't have the right tools. When it's something that you don't do often, you're not going to buy the right stuff for it. Uh, we talked a little bit more about the tools in the first video that I did on measuring the house. Uh, you can go check that out at the YouTube, uh, North Star MLS YouTube website. Um, and I'll go through them briefly again here. But you do need to get the proper tools for any job that you're going to do. And also, of course, the huge reason that you don't do it, you don't know how. It's hard to do something that you don't know how. It's uncomfortable to do something you don't know how. So I'm hoping that this um, video will give you a little bit of information, make you feel more comfortable when you go out to a house so you know what you're doing, you're more comfortable, you're not as scared to even give it a try. All right? So we're going to try to change all these things. First of all, making you uncomfortable. Go back to eighth grade. A couple of basics you need to know. When you draw a sketch of a house, you're measuring the outlines of the house from the outside. Once you've got those outlines, you've got to figure out what the square footage is. Now, there are programs that will help you with this. As an appraiser, I have appraisal software that I draw the sketch and it does all my math for me. There is a free appraisal software app that you can use. Uh, the company is a la mode and um, the the app is called Total, T-O-T-A-L. So you can just go to your app store, and it works on Android, it works on iPad, it works on your iPhone, and you can actually do the sketch right from there. I don't tend to do mine right on there because it's easier for me to do use graph paper when I'm at the house, but then you can transfer it to that uh, software, and it will do the math for you. If you don't have that, back in the olden days when I first started, we didn't have those apps. We just did the sketch and then did the math off of it. Basically, every house comes out to be mostly a series of rectangles. 
You just divide up the sketch into rectangles and do your basic length times width to come up with the square footage. If you've got triangles for bay windows, um, that's one half base times height. Okay, most bay windows involve two triangles, so you can just call it a rectangle um, and skip the one half part. And then if you have circular rooms, well, they're a little difficult, but um, <laughs> I just hope you don't get a house with circles. But on a circle, you can do the pi r squared, which is 3.14 times the radius, and the radius is from the center of the circle out. So just some basic math that you learned in eighth grade, you're going to have to use it again. Before we get to the houses, let's start with lot sizes. A lot of people don't give a whole lot of uh, thought to the lot sizes, but it does affect how people uh, look at that home. The size of the lot matters, whether it's, you know, a third of an acre, a quarter of an acre, but the order of the dimensions that you put into MLS matters also. Here's um, a property in Hennepin County out in Mound. If you look at the lot size where it's circled, this one even tells you that northeast is 37, and then it's 159 by 90 by 150. That order matters, and I'll show you the layout of the, the plat map in a second. But the first number is always the road frontage. It's always how wide the property is at the road. The reason this matters is if the numbers were transposed and you started with a 159, people would think that this was a really wide lot and that you had lots of space between you and your neighbors. You don't. It's a 37 foot across the front. Uh, makes it pretty narrow. It's more of a pie-shaped property. It's on a corner, so that's why it's a little bit narrower and the back is wider. This is also Lakeshore. So that fourth number, 90, is vitally important to value and to appeal of the home. That 90 is the lake frontage of this property. Again, if you had the numbers transposed and maybe somebody thought it had 159 feet of Lakeshore, the house would be worth a heck of a lot more money on Lake Minnetonka. So the standard is always the first number is road frontage, and then you go around clockwise. All right. So if I'm face, standing in the street facing the property, 37 is across the front and down the left hand side is the 159 across the back is 90 and back up on the right hand side is 150. So it's clockwise. Now, just to give you a little heads up, if you're working up in the lake country, uh, up in Brainerd, because Lakeshore is so important to them, they often tra do transpose the numbers and use it differently where to them, the Lakeshore is is why people are buying that house. So they often use the first number as the lake frontage. So be aware of that if you're up there, but the standard is always that the first number is uh, the street. Here is the plat map of that property. That first number was 37. That's along the street you can see at the top up there. And then it goes around clockwise, 159 around the side, 90 is what they've got for lake frontage, and 150 back up the other side. So as you're putting these numbers into MLS, pay attention to that. It does affect how wide a lot is, especially on city lots. If um, people have a double wide lot, that first number is going to be bigger than anybody else in the neighborhood, and that's going to be important to somebody buying the house. So pay attention to that. Here's another property where it just gives two digits. If they're just two numbers, the first number is the front and back. The second number is the two sides. This is actually a double lot. They're both 50 feet wide that were combined. So you can see 100 is what's on the street and on the lake and then the 205 at the sides okay so that's the two different ways that numbers work on lots so just pay attention to the lot size it will help you figure out um, if you have a double lot or how much lake frontage you have how much road frontage and it helps figure out what's going on at the property uh, this is just some basic information on uh, measurements that you need to know. I know when we all started out in real estate school, we had to know how far a mile was. Uh, acreage is the one that always comes up for us. Uh, 43560, that's how many square feet are in an acre. So if you've got the lot size, it's 100 by 205, multiply that and then divide by 43560 and it will give you the uh, how big the lot size is. Now, luckily, most of our tax records have the lot size in them and you don't have to figure that out but sometimes you do need to at least know that piece of information. All right, just gonna quickly go over some of the tools because as I mentioned, we did go that, through that in another video, but I always use two tape measures. One is a very long fiberglass tape measure, 100 foot tape me uh, fiberglass tape measure. It's fiberglass because when you're measuring in the snow and the rain, metal will rust and it wears out more quickly. The other tape measure is your standard tape measure that any carpenter uses uh, on your hip, but you do like to use a wide blade so it doesn't bend as quickly when you're extending it out from you. I use graph paper to do the sketch on. It helps keep things neat and it's easier to figure out the distances. 
Uh, this is a very technical term. <laughs> uh, I use a pointy thing. A screwdriver or something like that works just as well. Just something to hold the tape measure down if you cannot get up close to the house. Um, you can stick uh, a screwdriver or something like that through the end of the tape measure into the ground in front of the house and then draw it across the ground in front of the house. And then you don't have to get up close to the house if there's too many bushes or something like that. I use a clipboard uh, to be able to write on. And of course, proper attire. And again, it has to be comfortable shoes. You're going to be walking around outside, up and down uh, boulder walls, across the uh, snow drifts that people plow in their driveways, uh, trying to avoid window wells, things like that. So make sure you're dressed appropriately. Uh, and anytime your paper gets wet, you cannot write on the paper anymore. So if there's any hint of moisture, I wear a huge raincoat with a big hood to be able to keep the paper dry. So just think about things like that before you go out to measure the house. And I, as I mentioned, that free app that you can look up in the App Store, Alamode is the company, and the program is called Total, and that can help you out quite a bit. Now, a couple of definitions here. Above ground finished square footage. Uh, by the way, you also may hear it as above grade. It's the same thing. The definition there is total finished square footage measured at and above ground level as it appears from the front view of the building. And the asterisk there is for finished. Finished means permanently, safely, and sufficiently heated. So you have to have heat in the home, in the, in the room, to be, have it be considered part of the finished square footage. So above ground finished square footage, as you walk up to the front of the house, anything that is at that level or higher is considered above ground finished square footage. Below ground is measured below the ground level as it appears from the front of the home. So if you walk in the front door of the home and have to go down five steps to a room, that's below ground finished square footage, even if it's a walk out to the back. Okay, so it's all measures from the front of the house. Now, of course, with every rule, there are some exceptions. There are some houses where you walk down one or two steps into the family room or the big great room or something like that. If you think about it, you walked up to the front door usually four or five steps. So if you only went down one or two steps to the family room, that is still above ground. It's still above ground level at the front of the house. Maybe you just had to walk up a couple of steps to get to the front door. So just a couple of steps to a sunken living room or a family room is fine. But once you start going down five, six, seven steps, that becomes below ground finished square footage, not above ground. There are also some interesting homes that are kind of backwards, uh, sometimes on lakeshore properties. Uh, there's a slope down to the lake, or there are a lot of uh, properties, um, ramblers that are kind of upside down, where when you walk into the rambler, you may walk in at the tuck under garage, and there's a door down there. But that is basement level. As you walk in that level, that's where the utilities are, and that's where a family room is and a half bath. But then you go upstairs, and that's where the kitchen and the living room are. So from the front door, it appears as though it's all above ground finished square footage. But if you use it like a traditional rambler, the upper level where you would access it from the backyard is where your main floor really is, the kitchen, the bedrooms, the living room, stuff like that. And when you go downstairs, you get to the utility room. So in a case like that, go ahead and measure it as a traditional rambler where you're assuming that the back of the house is really the front of the house because that's how it functions. And just put it in the comments to make sure people know that. Um, that's how, as an appraiser, I use it. It's just a walk-up rambler. Otherwise, it would be a weird two-story with a kitchen on the second floor and no basement. Because if you're walking in that lower level and you're calling that above grade because that's uh, the front of the house, technically, then you have no basement. Um, as I mentioned also, there's some lake properties that are like this. We've got a big slope down to the lake. And at, at road level, as you're driving up to the house, you would come in at the level where there are bedrooms and you know the master bedroom and things like that. You walk down a flight of stairs to the kitchen. Again, that is not how a normal house is used. So that feels a little bit weird if you call that above grade finished square footage and you walk downstairs and you call the kitchen, say that the kitchen's in the basement. That's not how that house functions. So in that case, again, walk around to the back of the house and consider the lake frontage to be the front of the home was the main door and you walk in at kitchen level and that would consider that above grade and then the bedroom's on the second floor. But again, in the case like that, make sure you don't also claim that there's a basement. You can only claim each floor once. So... For almost all the houses you come to, if you're coming up to the front door, anything that's finished is um, above grade finished square footage from the front door and higher. Anything that is measured from the front door and lower is uh, below ground square footage. There's a whole neighborhood um, that a lot of people are mistaken. I don't know if it's one office that taught them this or what, but you'll come across some stuff in um, South Minneapolis where their above ground finished square footage is uh, where they just consider that the second floor. So a lot of times you'll have a foundation size of like 1,100 square feet and their above ground square footage will say 420 
because they're just con counting the second floor of a, as a one and a half story. That is not correct. Above ground for square footage, above ground finished square footage is main floor and anything above that. Um, by the way, the definition of finished also, uh, the permanently, safely, sufficiently heated, it also has to have finished surfaces. Don't try to tell somebody that the basement is finished if it's got a concrete floor and an open ceiling. Okay, it has to have floor, it has to have ceiling, it has to have walls. Of course, there's an exception to this rule also, <laughs> um, especially downtown condos. They have concrete floors, they have brick exposed walls, and they have open ceilings. That's what's accepted in that kind of property, so you can consider that finished. But in a 1940s bungalow, don't consider the basement finished just because you painted the concrete floor. Okay. Um, if there is a partially finished area where you've got like floor and walls, but nobody finished the ceiling, take photos of it to include it in MLS. Talk about it in MLS because it does have some value. It does have some appeal, but everybody who's using MLS, whether it's another agent to use it as a market analysis, another agent bringing their buyer out there or an appraiser using it as a comp, we need to know what's going on. Why did this house sell for less than another house just like it? Oh, it's because the basement's not really finished. Or why did the agent claim that it's got a finished basement um, in a family room down there, but then put zero in the square footage? Tell us what's going on down there. Use some pictures. So it has to have all three, floor, ceiling, and walls to be considered finished. Uh, just a couple of definitions. Um, in MLS, uh, on a one-line list, you've got different abbreviations going across. Total finished square footage is the TFSF, and that includes above ground and below ground finished square footage. GLA is an appraiser term, but you may have seen it on appraisals or you've heard somebody talking about gross living area. That is the exact same definition as above ground finished square footage. It's just what appraisers call it. So GLA is above ground. GBA, you may not hear as often, that's gross building area. That generally comes up for appraisers in multifamily properties. That's the overall square footage of the property, regardless of what's finished and what's not. So you'll see like on a duplex GBA and maybe each duplex has got a thousand square feet finished but they've also got a, a public foyer and then an unfinished basement so the GBA may be like 3,000 square feet instead of the 2,000 that the two building the two units are okay so those are just some basic definitions that you may come across all right here's a house that was listed a couple of years ago keep in mind the square footage again representing the seller don't undersell the house We've all had clients that have come to us and say, okay, I'm looking for a new house. My current house is too small. I got to have a house that's at least 2,000 square feet. Well, I came across this property and I was going to do the appraisal on it. And before I go out to do the appraiser, I always try to look up what comps I'm going to use. And as an appraiser, when I'm doing a uh, value, I need to find at least one house that's exactly the same square footage. If I can't find one that's exactly the same square footage, I have to find at least one house that's smaller and at least one house that's bigger an above ground finished square footage. We always work in above ground. So I'm looking at this house and thinking a two story that's only 1872 square footage, there's nothing else in the neighborhood that's that small that sold. So I was struggling with this at first. So I went out to the property and I got out there and this is my sketch of the property and look at the total livable, 2356. This agent underestimated by about 500 square feet on the size of this property. That is huge. Again, if I had a client who was looking for something at least 2,000 square feet and I typed that into MLS, this property wouldn't have even come up. And here it's plenty big. So he was doing a disservice to his clients. Now, I took a look, and what he did was he took the information off of the tax records. And this is out in Jordan. Their tax records, at least for this neighborhood, I double-checked with the other properties that I looked at in the area. The square footage that the tax records gave was the main floor plus the attached garage. Didn't take into account the second floor at all. So he was using bad information without even knowing it, never even measured the house. So make sure you measure the house and don't trust the tax records. You can see from here the first floor, 1172, uh, that plus the garage pretty much equaled that uh, 1872 that he gave there. The second floor in this house has got a little jut out up above the bedroom. If you look at the sketch, you can see that second floor bedroom juts out a little bit. So as I'm walking around the house and measuring, I take a look up there, make sure I see where that bedroom is. Um, also note that the garage tucks back into the house a little bit. This is a good reason to walk on all four sides of the house. The left side and the right side measurements on the house are different, and it's because the garage tucks back into it. So make sure you pay attention to that. This is the software that I use uh, for my appraisal software. And if you look at the right-hand side where it says living area breakdown, the software even breaks it down into rectangles, just like I told you you have to do manually if you don't have the software. 
it took the first floor and broke it into two different rectangles. The first one is the 25 by 44, which is the big chunk of the house, and then that extra little part that sticks out the front where the den is in front of the porch. That's 3 by 24. So it breaks it down into rectangles just the way you'll, you'll do it. So that's how it works there. So make sure you do not undersell uh, your client's home. I talked about the... Um, uh, that the house has to be, each room has to be sufficiently heated in order to be considered part of square footage, which means that a three season porch is not part of finished square footage. A three season porch has value. Go ahead and measure the dimensions of it to include it in the grid in MLS that says there's a lovely three season porch that's 14 by 16, but don't add that 14 by 16 into the above grade finished square footage. A four season porch, if it has heat and can be used all year round, that can be included. Three season porch cannot. Uh, we do not include garages into finished square footage. Um, even if the garage is heated, even if the garage has an epoxy floor, that's not considered part of the house. That's not how somebody would use the house. Um, somebody asked me this the other day, and I kind of flippantly said, well, if a woman would live there, <laughs> you can consider the garage finished square footage. So if someone has completely converted the garage, drywall, carpet, and made it actually part of the home, yes, you can consider it. But if you're still going to park a, uh, a car in there, no, even if it's heated. Um, unfinished areas. So there are often uh, one and a half story homes where the upper level has not been finished off yet. You cannot consider that part of finished square footage even though their potential there is to finish that off. You can still call it a one and a half story home because that's what it is. That's how it can function in the future, but then you can only count the main level as finished square footage. Put in the comments somewhere how much could be finished upstairs to give people an idea of how big the house can be if they finish the upper level. But don't put that in the, uh, in the line that says total finished square footage. Also areas that are accessed from the outside. Now, I have to give you a, a little caveat here. Appraisers do not consider that finished square footage, but MLS will allow you to. So here's the deal. If you have a house with a bonus room above the garage, but you have to access it by going out to the garage, then going upstairs in the garage to get to that bonus room, appraisers do not consider that part of finished square footage. Yes, it has value. We will make a note of it. We will give it some value, but we do not consider it part of finished square footage. Same thing with carriage houses. If you have to walk outside the main house and go out to a carriage house, appraisers consider that to have value, but we don't include it in the above ground finished square footage. However, MLS does allow that. So you can put, if you're working in a house in Minneapolis and you've got a 4,000 square foot house with another 1,000 square foot carriage house, you can put 5,000 square feet into above ground finished square footage. But do everybody a favor, whether it's the buyers coming to look at the house or agents using it as comps or appraisers using it as comps, divide that out somewhere in the comments so we know how big the actual house is and how big the carriage house is so that we can figure out the breakdown and figure out where the value is included there. Okay. Um, also, two-story foyers. If you have a house where the main floor is 1,200 square feet and it's a two-story and upstairs the outline looks like 1,200 square feet also, but you've got a cutout for the second floor as a two-story foyer. You cannot include that in finished square footage. I've talked to builders about this. They like to include it, and they say it costs just as much to build it, but we're not talking cost here. If you can't put a bed up there, don't consider it part of the square footage. I used to work for a builder, and one of their basic two-story floor plans was either a four-bedroom two bath upstairs or a three bedroom, two bath with a two story foyer. So it took place of exactly one bedroom and that has value to people. So make sure you don't include the two story foyer. Also don't include chimneys and I'll show you what I mean on the next slide. Um, this house, this is a house with a nice catwalk. If you look at the, on the uh, sketch on the left hand side, that's the main floor sketch. See the fireplace in the back, right in the family room. That fireplace hangs out a little bit. The chimney goes out to the back of the house. I just ignore that when I'm measuring the house. It's just part of the fireplace. It's not square footage that got added to the house. On the other hand, if that family room had next to that fireplace, maybe a six-foot built-in that bumped out like that, I would give them credit for that because that built-in does add square footage. They can store stuff there and things like that. But as I'm measuring that back wall there, I just completely ignore that the chimney exists there. Now you can take a look at this sketch also. This addresses the two-story foyer. Take a look at the upper right-hand side where it says second floor. That is the shape of the upstairs. It is not the exact same shape as the downstairs. It's hard to tell that from the outside. So if you're just taking a quick measure of the main floor and not paying attention, uh, you're going to miss the fact that the upstairs is much smaller than the main floor. As I'm walking around the house measuring, 
as I get to the back of the house, I see through the windows that, oh, there's a two-story family room in here. And I can take a look and see as I'm measuring across the back wall where that ceiling stops in the second floor. So I got that 22 uh, measurement that's on that upstairs from the outside as I'm walking along, taking a look at the uh, main floor. So I walked around and did the whole main floor, making notes where I saw the two-story floor and things like that. Then when I came inside from the main floor, looking up where the ceiling's cut off, I double-checked that 22-foot uh, mark, and I double-checked the uh, 14 that goes across there, uh, the, where the uh, second floor is open across the dining room. And then I went upstairs and I measured the whole thing from upstairs also. It's much harder to get measurements from the inside because you have to look down hallways, you have to uh, take a peek through bedrooms, you have to include closets. But I could balance things up, line them up with how big I knew the, uh, the main floor was uh, and where these things lined up from the outside. I knew that the total distance from front to back of the house equaled the same as the main floor. It's just how many cutouts there were. So if you have two-story family rooms, two-story foyers, you're going to have to double check them from a couple of different places, uh, get as much as you can information from the outside, then come inside, and you're going to have to get some more information from in there. But the second floor of this house is significantly smaller than the first floor. If I had just doubled the first floor, I would have been misleading people by quite a bit. If you'll notice also, the basement is pretty much the same shape as the main floor. It just doesn't have the bay window. And that uh, often happens. Just pay attention to that as you're walking around the outside of the house and making a note of which, which the rooms are just on the main floor, which rooms are just on the upper floor, if there's a bump out, things like that. All right, now here's a house that from the front looks like it's pretty easy to measure. Okay, you got the garage over to the right and then the main house on the left-hand side. Notice that upstairs has an overhang. When you're measuring from the outside, it's really hard to figure out how big that overhang is sometimes as you're standing below it looking up. But I could tell that the bumped out window in the living room, that section that's in white, that lined up with the overhang upstairs. And I could get that window measurement from the main floor. So I, got, I could figure out how big the, main floor, the second floor was from the main floor as I'm measuring. So I walked around the house and took care of all that. Now here's the view of kind of the side angle of the house. That garage that was on the right, now it's on our left. Notice that that is a big garage and there's a big picture window. So that's not all garage. Again, as I measure around the outside, I get the outside measurements, but then I need to kind of figure out what's going on on the inside. Here's the sketch of that house. There's the bump out in the living room on the left-hand side, that little one-foot bump out, all right? And that main floor is 25 feet front to back. And then remember I told you the bump out matched the second floor. So if you look at the second floor, that's 26 feet front to back because that matches up with the bump out. And then take a look at the garage. That whole distance that I saw on the side picture of the garage uh, was, what, uh, 33 and a half. But only part of that was garage because the family room went behind the garage. See how the family room, the picture window there is behind the garage? If you measure straight across the front there, it feels like it's all garage. You got to take a look inside. So I double checked the measurement and measured the family room from the inside and measured the garage from the inside and made sure that I had both of those. I always double check measurements. Take a look also next to the stairs on that main floor. See where the door to the garage is? I almost missed that. But if you walk out into the garage, there's the doorway to the garage right there on the right hand side. See where that uh, blue tote is on top of the gray thing? That is a four foot bump out that if I had missed that, I would have missed giving them nine by four square footage in the house. I would have assumed that the uh, garage was just a basic rectangle. So always open doors and take a look in the garage because a lot of times there are bump outs from the house, taking room away from the garage and making the house itself bigger. So again, you can see next to the stairs on that main floor, the doorway bumps out there four feet into the garage and this is how it looks like into the garage. So when I peeked my head out into the garage and I saw that bump out, I did double checked measurements there to make sure I knew where things went, okay? Open doors, go to all levels, make sure things match up, make sure things all make sense before you leave the house. Now here's another house. <laughs> Some new construction can get kind of tricky. This is a nightmare to measure from the outside because once you're under that porch on the front, it's really hard to figure out how big the bump out is on the upper level. It's hard to see that upper level left-hand side where you've got the green bump out and then the white bump out above that. <laughs> it can get complicated from the outside. I figured out as much as I could, but then I gotta tell you, once I went inside, pretty much all that was fake. 
Uh, most of that was just decorative stuff on the outside of the house and didn't actually equate, equate to any square footage on the inside. So don't take, double check everything. Once I got inside, I realized that that second bump out on the left hand side where it's uh, stone at the bottom, then green, and then the white bump out bumps out forward. That white bump out is a window seat. So it is a couple feet off the ground. There's no actual floor under that. So that doesn't count as square footage. Again, having a nice window seat gives some value, but there's no floor space there. The same as there's no floor space for a two-story foyer. So you don't get credit. So that second white bump out that up there, I didn't have to account for at all. Uh, the one above, kind of next to the one-car garage, that bump out was an open loft area. That was a two-story foyer. So that has a decorative bump out on the front, but it actually cut in upstairs. So just pay attention as you're going around outside. Once you get inside, make sure things make sense on the inside. By the way, just as a side note, this was a total pain across the front of the house, and it took me forever trying to figure it out. Then I get to the back of the house. Woohoo! Nice and easy. Just a quick straight measurement across all three floors, exactly the same. So it made up for it. So sometimes you get off easy. Uh, this is another house that uh, just on the back of it, just trying to point out that there are three different sizes here. If you look at the basement level, that's a straight shot straight across. So I can just run my tape measure the whole distance of that house and know how big the basement is. But when it came to the main floor where the deck is, I had a kitchen bump out, the little one behind the grill, and that was just a window bump out, like a garden window. So that one I didn't count also because that didn't have any floor under it. But where the sliding glass door is, I had to make, adjust make an adjustment for that, make an uh, accommodations for that. So the, the basement is just a straight line, then the main floor has a straight line, but with a bay window. And then the second floor upstairs, I had assumed from the front of the house that it was gonna be all the way across and be the same size as the main floor, but notice where the wall in the second floor stops. As I was downstairs at basement level looking up, I could line up and figure out how big that was. So I got that outside measurement, the second floor measurement from the basement level as I'm standing there. But then when I went inside, I had to double check things. And what that was, uh, that's the master bathroom, that second window up there. You can see the blinds um, in the second floor all the way to the left. And then the uh, room cuts forward a little bit. And then the walk-in closet does come out to be the same uh, as far left as the rest of that wall does. So the upstairs ended up being kind of just a, an L shape upstairs. So again, pay attention to all three levels as you're walking around. It makes it much easier when you're outside to figure out where things line up than to try to figure out where they line up inside. So with something like this, once I go inside, I know the basic measurement of the second floor where that one wall ends, and then I just have to double check things on the inside and figure out how far forward they go. So pay attention to all four levels, all, all levels as you're going around. This is another house that looks more complicated from the front than it did when I got inside. The bay window there for the sink, <clears throat> I measured that from the outside and then I got inside and figured out that was a fake also. Uh, there was no floor space under that. That was just a garden window again. They just dropped the, the facade down a lot in the front. I peeked under the kitchen sink and there was no cupboard space under there. It was a straight, straight uh, kitchen sink to him as normal. It was not a bump out. So again, check things when you get back inside and make sure that they make sense according to the outside, that you're not giving them more credit because they put decorative flares on the outside. Here's a basic bay window. If you take a look at it, uh, when you're measuring it, it's basically one, one rectangle and two triangles. So you can figure out the measurements. If you are working with software, <clears throat> Uh, you do not have to measure the actual distance of the angled wall. What you measure is how far over it went and how far out it went. So I wouldn't measure the actual angled line there. What I would measure is from the flat wall where the house is to the wall where the bump out is, I would measure that distance if that's three feet out. And then I would measure from the distance from the angled wall where it starts to the angled wall where it stops, and that's two feet out. So you get the kind of the other two dimensions of the triangle that it's going to be instead of that one angled wall. And your software will know how to deal with that. All right, one and a half stories. Now, if you watch the other video, we talked about a one and a half story home and how you have to measure the second floor. I'll just go through it a little bit here. So here's a basic one and a half story. You measure the main floor. That's going to be pretty much a rectangle. This one's got a little bit of a bump out. But then the upper floor is not as big as the main floor. Here are some basic measurements. The main floor, uh, you measure from the outside as normal, but when you go inside, all rooms with slope ceilings must maintain an average height of seven feet for over 
half of the whole finished area. So your ceiling has to be at least seven feet high in the upstairs. A lot of the homes, the one and a half stories that are built in the 20s or earlier, the second floor doesn't even have a seven foot ceiling height. If that's the case, you can't legally consider that above ground finished square footage. But most of the ones built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, they all have at least seven feet high in the middle. So you're good to go there. But the sloped ceiling height requirement stops the finished measurement at the five foot mark on any sloped wall. So go to where that wall slopes, figure out where it meets five feet. Very often that's just in one foot from the edge of the room or two feet in from the edge of the room. And that's where you measure the finished square footage. You do not get to consider square footage if the ceiling height drops below five feet. So people will still use that floor space. That's where they throw their bean bags, their dirty laundry, their dog beds or whatever. But you can't consider it finished square footage unless the ceiling height is five feet high. So if you measure at ground level in this room, it may be 13 feet across at ground level. But if you measure the five foot high mark, it may be only 10 feet across. That's the measurement that you have to use. And very often you will find that a one and a half story is exactly one and a half stories. That downstairs may be 24 feet front to back. And when you go upstairs and take that five foot measurement, that it will be uh, 12 feet. This is kind of a bad picture, but just to give you the view of the sloped walls, you're only going to measure from where ceiling height is five feet high. This is an interesting house that was a little bit complicated. Um, the agent on this one, good agent, been in the business for years. She does an excellent job, but she also took the measurements from tax records. And if you'll notice that front of the house where the, if you look at the right-hand side, the window is a different size from the windows in the back. Previously, this house had, that was a three-season porch. And at some point, some homeowner had opened up the interior wall uh, so it's now open to the living room, makes it a nice big sunroom, and it's completely heated. So that entire width of the house, and I think it was about 36 feet across by about 8 feet deep, that is now all considered part of finished square footage. It wasn't when it was part of the tax records, when they reported it to tax records. That was a three-season porch. So this agent, again, even though she's good, been in the business forever, does a good job, just took this square footage off of tax records, so she missed reporting this house being anywhere near as big as it really was because that entire width, that entire porch area, 8 by 36, is now part of finished square footage. So again, another good reason not just to take information off of tax records. But take a look at the upstairs. This is not your typical one and a half story where you just got a straight run of the walls. This has got part of the area there where the three windows are on the second floor that bump out, but then you've got the sloping wall on the sides. So I need to know how big that whole bump out is and then I need to know where the walls cut down to five feet high and cut back in for that. It's not going to be just a straight run across the top up there. When you get inside, you can see where this bed is. That is where those bump outs are. That is sitting right in front of those three windows on the upper level. Okay, the bed is right in those three windows on the upstairs. Then to the left here, you see the closet. That's where the sloping ceiling is on the outside. So I measure the distance where that bed is. I don't know, it was 12 feet across or something like that. And then I had to come back along this wall to figure out where this uh, closet meets the five foot high mark. And that's where I get to consider that room. So the upstairs here doesn't end up being a basic rectangle like it does in a traditional one and a half story. It's, it's got some cutouts and things like that for where you come back to the five foot high mark. This is the room on the other side of those windows upstairs. There's a little bitty room above the stairs. So again, I have to go to where the five foot mark is on this room. So Again, on some houses, the second floor, you're going to have to walk around and re-measure from the inside and get as many measurements as you can. This is a little bit of an illustration of that one and a half story again. The main rectangle at the bottom is the main floor, and then upstairs you've got that slopey ceiling, but you only get to consider the finished area where it meets the five-foot high mark. So be sure you pay attention to that. All right. Uh, basic measurements for an egress window. You can't call it a window a... a basement in the bedroom unless it's got an egress window. Uh, by the way, we get a lot of questions on what's a legal bedroom. Uh, the problem is there's lots of answers to this question. Um, a legal bedroom will vary by city. Some uh, communities want you to have a closet, some want you to have an egress window, some want you to have a door, some want you to be at least 70 square feet. Um, then the cities also have different rules on what you can call a legal bedroom if you're renting the house. And then appraisers have different rules. So here are the basics. MLS rule is you get to call it a bedroom if that community, if that city gets, calls it a bedroom. So if Minnetonka rules say this can be considered a bedroom and your house is listed in Minnetonka, in MLS you can call it a bedroom. Keep in mind, though, that it's not the city officials who are using MLS. 
So if you're going to call it a legal bedroom because Minnetonka and MLS let you call it that, at least put some comments into MLS for the agents and the buyers and everybody else who uses MLS to follow our standards. And the standards that realtors and appraisers go by is that to be considered a, a bedroom, it has to have a closet, it has to have a window, it has to have a door. If it's below grade, it has to have an egress window. Okay. Of course, there are exceptions to this. If you're in a 1910 house and it doesn't have a closet, that's kind of accepted in a 1910 house. Just put those comments in there. Um, if you're in a 1980 house, though, and it doesn't have a closet, that's completely not acceptable. That's a den, okay? If you call it a den, everybody knows you can still make your kids sleep there, but at least it lines it up properly. So make sure to try to remember that MLS is for the people who are using it, for the agents, for the buyers, um, the appraisers. So tell us what's going on so we know what to face. Um, I come across a lot of houses where the egress window, the window in the basement doesn't meet the egress standards. And you can look this up on the web anywhere for what egress standards are. Uh, the minimum uh, open area, the minimum height and the minimum width are smaller than the minimum open area. So if you only meet the minimum opening height of 24 inches and the opening width of 20 inches, you do not meet the minimum opening of 5.7 square feet. So one of those, either the height or the width, has to be bigger than the min minimum to meet the overall opening. And keep in mind, this is egress. It's for people to be able to get out of the house, but it's also for a firefighter to get in with full equipment on. So there, you have to have openings outside. You can't have locked gates across the window. You can't be under a deck, things like that. It's, it's all for safety. One of the things I come across a lot is that the sill height of the window from the floor on the inside can't be higher than 44 inches. And that's, again, for people to be able to climb up and get out of the window. Uh, so a lot of times it looks like the window's huge, but it's just too high. So just pay attention to these, write this down, print this up somewhere. Again, you can get it off the web to have it with you. And again, if you tell people in MLS that it's a den, the window is just too high, that's fine. It's just so everybody knows when they get there <clears throat> or knows before they bother to see the house whether or not it's a legal bedroom. All right, here is a sketch that sometimes confuses people. Can you tell what style of house this is by looking at it? If you think about it, you've been in this style before. If you walk in the front door off the porch, there you come to the kitchen, get the little bay window to the front, the dining room back there with the sliding glass door to the right. Those are the only two rooms that are on the main level. Then you go up half a flight of stairs, and that's where your living room, the bedrooms, the master bedroom are. You go down half a flight, you get the family room, the bedroom, the laundry, and the half bath, and down another half a flight, and you get to the unfinished utility room. This is a four-level split. If you look at the way it's drawn, it's drawn like a rambler. People get very confused a lot of times with how many levels are above grade in a four-level split. And there are a couple of different styles, but this is the style that's most common. There are two levels above grade, two levels below grade. When you're walking around the outside of the house, that's how, to measure it, that's how you treat it. When you walk inside, basically just figure out those steps or just those half levels, and if you evened out the house, it would look like a rambler. Here's a rambler, then an earthquake hits it, and it becomes a four-level split. That's all it is. A four-level split is a rambler that's a little bit off kilter. So when you walk in that main floor without going up or down any steps, you're in the kitchen. Then you go up half a flight and you're upstairs. So that is all main floor. You have to go down half a flight to get to that family room. Even if that's a walkout, you do not get to call that part of above grade finished square footage because you had to go down half a flight of stairs to get to that. Okay. So when you're drawing a sketch and trying to figure out the square footage of a four level split, in general, it's going to be just like a rambler. All right. Here's our earthquake again. <laughs> Uh, this is a three-level split. Again, you're probably familiar with this design. You've seen it many times. That's the front of it. Here's the back of it. The back, it looks like a regular split entry. Uh, there's that side sliding glass door that a lot of three levels have, just like the four level does. The difference on this house is once you go inside, you need to figure out how big that basement is. It's usually the same size as the upper level, okay? But double check when you're down in the basement and make sure that, it's, that you've figured out exactly how uh, big the basement is from back to the center of the house. You can get the outside measurements for the width here all the way across the back on the basement, but you don't know exactly how far it extends into the house. Again, it usually is the same size as the upper level, but double check that. And by the way, uh, the definition of full basement versus partial basement in the amenities section down at the bottom of the uh, MLS sheet, full basement is if it's the same size as the main level. A three-level split, the whole definition of it is that the basement is half the size of the main level. So if you've got a three-level split, don't say that it's got a full basement. This house is an example of a different kind of four-level split. These are more common in Edina. This is a four-level split where three levels actually are fully above grade. 
okay? So in a case like this, this won't be drawn like a rambler. This would be drawn more like a two-story house. So under the porch, or that dark area, that's the front door. You walk in there and that's the kitchen and dining room and stuff like that. That's above grade because you're walking in from the front door right from there. When you go to the right to the brick area, that's the family room or the living room. So that is just up a couple of steps and that's still above grade. Then you go back up uh, the stairs up to the second floor and that's where all the bedrooms are. The only basement is underneath that brick area. Okay, so again, the four level split, it still is like a, a, a rambler on an earthquake, but this time three of the levels stayed above grade and only one of them is below grade. So in this case, the white area where the front door is and the brick area I would draw as the main floor. Then I would draw the upstairs as a second floor. And then the basement is only going to be, again, a partial basement, and it's just going to be the section underneath the red area. But I would go down and double check that basement, make sure the square footage lines up, that it makes sense under there. But essentially, again, Think of a rambler, hit an earthquake, and the floor has just got uh, askew. Just in this case, three levels are above grade, one level is below grade, where a standard four-level split, two levels are above grade, and two are below grade. So again, I'd draw this like a two-story, but in MLS, I would report that it has a partial basement, because if it had a full basement, it would be the entire size of the white area plus the brick area. So there are some exceptions to the rule on the four-level split size. Uh, this is a minor thing, but if you're reading an appraisal and you're looking at the room counts, the grid that has a room counts, it may throw you off a little bit. When we put in room counts, it may say something like um, uh, 631. That means there are six rooms, three of them are bedrooms, and one of them is a bathroom. However, that's not how it adds up. If it's 631, uh, three of the six are the bedrooms, and then the other rooms are kitchen, living room, and dining room. The bathroom doesn't get included in that six, so it just makes it a little bit confusing. We don't include laundry rooms in that main number. Um, we generally don't include lofts in that main number, though some people do, so that will be a little off sometimes. Um, so just if you're reading an appraisal, that's what you need to look at for the room count so you know what that means. Okay? So I hope that gives you some basic information on why it's important that we put in measurements correctly, why it's important to the not only to sell the house, but also for the database that we all use, uh, why lot sizes are important, the uh, order that you put the room dimensions in are important. And it takes some work and it takes some getting used to, but when you go out to a house to measure it, make sure your sellers aren't there. Take your time, take your graph paper, double check your numbers, go around all four sides of the house, Take a look as you're walking around. Is the basement the same as the main floor? Is the second floor the same as the main floor? And see where all the wa walls line up. Then when you go inside, double check all those. Make sure everything made sense as far as where how the sketch is working on the outside. Okay? It's going to be tough the first couple of times, but you'll make it. Thanks for your attention, and go measure a house.